My name is Jessica Burdett, and I'm with the Department of Commerce. I help manage the State Energy Office, uh, um, which includes oversight of the Conservation Improvement Program and a number of other programs. Um, you always run a risk of being the last speaker, and everybody has said all the great things, and uh, I have nothing to say now. But um, I wanted to start tonight um, in just a few minutes of the time that I have by way of a, a more personal introduction. Uh, um, the picture on the left is a, a picture of my great-grandpa, Truman Burdett, who was someone who brought uh, one of the first rural electric cooperatives to southern Iowa. Uh, this picture um, was in circa 1935, and as we saw earlier from David's presentation, that um, there was a huge push with the New Deal that my family was able to benefit from. Uh, um, our farm was established in 1894, and as a result of um, this co-op coming into to Mount Air, um, it was really able to transform the nature of our family business and uh, um, how we were able to survive some of the harder times in life. Uh, and you can see that, um, you know, the strapping young man on the left is my great grandpa. And on my right, uh, my grandpa ended up farming the land that continues to be served by the small cooperative in Iowa today. And I still have the good fortune to, to manage some of those operations um, from afar. So I point that out because there was a real transformative nature uh, of bringing that co op to Iowa, uh, to southern Iowa. And I see that. Co-ops today, as they had historically, were able to transform communities. Uh, and I see that, you know, in the stories that I've heard tonight uh, and uh, um, as I, I see going forward, I continue to see that, that we're on the cusp of a transformation uh, that enables communities to continue to, to you know, live and where they want to live and be and where they want to live. Uh, um, and that historically they've been central to the, the co-ops have been central to the success of these communities. Um, as we've seen technological evolution over time, you know, we've seen it in the agriculture industry and we've seen it in many other industries, and that's fundamentally impacted the way that co-ops have had to respond to the markets and, and continue to evolve their, their business models. Uh, and you've heard articulated um, a lot of the challenges and opportunities uh, that are afforded to those co-ops, um, but one of the things that I think I have the advantage of is I have this kind of eagle-eye view, um, having worked with over a, and continuing to work with over 180 utilities in the state, where I see different co-ops in different parts of the state that have different challenges, whether it's geography, whether it's changing demographics, whether it's economic challenge locally, um, uh, you get to see these different slices of life and where co-ops are able to serve people. And what I've seen, you know, with these little, I've seen problem solving with members of communities uh, to help them continue to be able to um, live in the communities that they want to live in. And it's been an amazing opportunity to see these problem solvings that are going on. Uh, um, you know, there's a, a, a utility, uh, a cooperative in northern Minnesota who had historically struggled um, to meet its conservation improvement program goals and energy efficiency goals. Um, and understanding what some of the challenges were, it were, was that, you know, consumers had a hard time accessing capital to be able to pay for those projects. Uh, and in order to make uh, some of those uh, projects uh, accessible, they started a pilot program to to bulk buy LED lights uh, and uh, charge for those lights on the utility bill. It's a small start uh, that creates this kind of hybrid on-bill financing uh, option, but they've been able to uh, disseminate and uh, um, gain more market acceptance in their community of those LED lights through offering this particular service to their members. Uh, and so it was a, uh, you know, a problem that was uh, attempted to be solved and has had success. And uh, what I see now is that this is a potential program that can be applied 
across a lot of other co-ops. And so one thing that we have the opportunity to do at the Department of Commerce is to take those um, uh, uh, new models and new programs that we see and potentially help other utilities implement them and scale them up uh, and expand them and and help that um, creation for those for the uh, uh, help those members better access those technologies uh, um, another one is in 2013 when we had the uh, propane shortage as a result of a, a, conflu a confluence of events uh, the Department of Commerce had issued, maybe a year or two earlier, uh, a policy around delivered fuels, and that for low-income consumers who were on delivered fuels, uh, it was okay for electric co-ops to be able to help those customers uh, through their electric conservation improvement programs, implement measures like uh, insulation, uh, air sealing, things like that, um, and take credit for the delivered fuel savings. Well. In that propane shortage, the nimble nature of some of the co-ops was um, they were able to, in relatively quick time, address some of the needs of those low-income consumers by helping them insulate their homes and helping them uh, um, uh, you know, weather the storm, if you will, of the polar vortex and the, and the propane shortage. And so, you know, some of the, the quick response and the success that we saw from that is helping us reevaluate our delivered fuel policies and understand how we might be able to expand them and, and continue to help members of those communities and those cooperatives help their consumers uh, or help their members. Um, and then lastly, I know uh, GRE's uh, uh, thermal storage, uh, water heater storage program has been mentioned a couple of times, but um, specifically, one of the things I like about that program is that it not only looks at a widget-based efficiency, where you look at uh, the efficiency that's delivered by the hot water heater to the member, but it also delivers efficiency to the system. Uh, and as we look at uh, some of the, oh, I didn't think I was gonna take that long. Uh, <laughs> I like it up here. Um, uh, so I'll wrap it up here real quick. Um, so what I like about that is that as we've looked at, you know, how we need to move away from widget-based efficiency programs, that one-for-one -one replacements uh, is not gonna continue to get us to our 1.5% goal we see opportunities for not only the, the services to the members that help them individually save energy and save money, but we also see the, the benefits that are delivered to the system, uh, which also serve the members. Uh, um, and as we look at that program, we see more models potentially that we can develop that can apply to other cooperatives um, that, that serve that same, those same benefits. And so the point being, <laughs> <laughs> is that co-ops have p played such a transformative role in communities in the past. Uh, um, they've served members' needs, uh, they've innovated, they've been able to problem solve in real time, in quick time, and, and create solutions that generally have helped the system as a whole. Uh, and one of the, the things that I like best about my job is that I get to see that happen and hopefully continue to create and help build those models that others uh, can use and help benefit their members. And so we live in a great time, work in a great industry, and in Minnesota we're very fortunate to have all of you smart, wonderful people participating in um, making all of this work for not only our co-ops but our consumers and citizens as well. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I plan to be on the panel now.